Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. So this week, we have a couple of stories that we wanted to just chat about. The first one is on May 12th of 2021, President Biden issued that executive order. Now, we did talk about that at the time, and it was about improving the nation's cybersecurity. The guidelines said that we had to improve practices on security for the supply, uh, the software supply chain. And so in conjunction with NIST, um, there was a development of guidance for the private sector and it was issued this year on February 4th. The guidance, the secure software development framework and related software supply chain security guidance includes a set of practices that create the foundation for developing secure software. So the executive order also includes directing the Office of Management and Budget that within 30 days of the issuance to take appropriate steps to require agencies to comply with guidance with respect to software procurement after the date of this order. So that was a press release that was actually on March of this year. I didn't see it until recently, so I thought it was really interesting because I did work in the military as part of acquisitions. And so now any type of software that is going to be purchased by the federal government has to be attested by the vendor that it has gone through secure software development practices. And so that will, number one, force vendors to either, you know, start following this framework or they're not going to be able to do business with the government. Now, OMB, the Office of Management Budget, understands that, you know, it's going to take some time for some of the vendors to implement some of this. So they are going to work with the private sector on how to require an attestation. But I thought it was really interesting. We talked about how the government is moving in the right direction. Even though it is such a big ship, it is steering in the right direction slowly. And, you know, I have good feelings about this. I think the administration is doing a good job, at least providing guidance they are not necessarily, you know, coming out with laws or anything like that, but they are saying, hey, if you want to do business with us, and they certainly are a big customer, you're going to have to start following secure practices. I, I do and have appreciated throughout the Biden administration, uh, several of the executive orders as they relate to cybersecurity requirements. I think they've been really positive developments. And sometimes like requirements or frameworks or audit frameworks can actually hold cybersecurity back. So the great example is modern password best practices and how today they don't recommend things like periodic password expiration, uh, password complexity requiring multiple character sets. Those sorts of things are actually not modern best practices for passwords, but so many Audit standards, for example, still require it that for many organizations, they can't give those up, even though they understand that they add little or no security value and may actually have a security impact in the negative direction. What I've seen come out of this has been mostly positive, and I think not so prescriptive and heavy handed to the point where it will be a detriment down the road. At least that's my hope you know, check in with me in a couple of years and I might be saying something totally different that this has handcuffed everyone and forced everyone who wants to do business with the government to adopt these kind of strategies where they don't make sense. But as we sit today in 2022, I think they're really, really positive developments. And, and I appreciate the call out here because I also didn't know about this and, and adding that additional attestation and rigor to software development to ensure a secure software supply chain. 
So the second article that I also missed was actually published in December of 2021. So right before the new year. And it was a Gartner article. And this one talks about how Gartner feels that consolidated security platforms are really the future. I mean, that's the title, right? That is the title. Yeah. Literally the title is consolidated security platforms are the future. And we'll put a link to the article in our show notes, but it is a very, very interesting read. So I'm just going to give you some of the key findings and recommendations out of this, but I do recommend that you go through it because it is kind of a roadmap of what organizations might want to do strategically when they're planning out, you know, their budgets, the products that they're looking at implementing and their security strategy going forward. So some of the key findings are driven by the need to reduce complexity, leveraging commodities and minimizing management overhead, security technologies convergence is accelerating across multiple disciplines. And I think that is definitely true. When you have multiple point solutions, that can be very complex to try to correlate all of that data together. Organizations are working or planning to uh, work on vendor consolidation strategies. There are long-term projects for most of them because it is a large architectural shift. And that is also very true because think about something like identity, right? Or an EDR solution. And if you're trying to consolidate those two things, that can be a lot of work to just move over to a different platform. Vendors are also increasingly divided into platform and portfolio camps with the former integrating tools to make a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts and the latter packaging products with very little integration. And technology consolidation is not limited to one technology area or even to a closely related set of technologies. These consolidations are happening in parallel across many security areas. Any thoughts on those key findings, Adam? Any thoughts? I have (laughs) several. You know, with the first kind of item you discussed about need to reduce complexity, leverage commonalities, minimize management overhead. Yes, it's all businessy speak. But Andy, you kind of went to a technical direction. You started talking about um, being able to take, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the term, correlate. Correlate is the word I was looking for to be able to correlate alerts across disparate tools into unified incidents uh, like in a SIM or something like that. Sure. That's one type of integration, but it's actually way bigger than that in terms of when you run multiple vendors, now you have procurement efforts and contracts with multiple vendors. They might all be on different renewal cycles. You have different support organizations, different customer success Uh, organizations that you interact with different ways to open tickets with each one of them. Maybe you have a different level of support where you might have unlimited tickets and advisory cases here, and you might have a very limited amount of support over there. You have different graphical user interfaces to learn different APIs to manage different language on how things are described. One vendor might call it this. Another vendor might call it that those are all things that aren't necessarily like in the technical uh, day-to-day of security operations, but they still impact your ability to bring all those disparate tools together. And this goes, we did a show, there was like a very, oh gosh, uh, a, a article published by a professor at Southern Methodist University, SMU, that got everyone in InfoSec riled up. And we talked about it on this show And it was like very counter to prevailing wisdom on most parts of InfoSec. And I defended it a little more than Andy did. If you go back to that show, because one of the points I made was how's that working out for you? You know, we have all these alleged best practices and things we should do. And I will say as somebody who talks to security people every single day, 
the prevailing belief is still best of breed to the, to this day, this Gartner article may start to change minds, but that's still the prevailing wisdom. And my step back is to look at how we're doing as an industry and say, how is best of breed working out for us? And I'd say, okay, at some organizations, maybe fairly well, but at a lot of organizations, not. And if we keep blaming the implementation and say, well, they're not doing it right, and they're not doing it right, and they're not doing it right. If something is that hard to do right, maybe the something is wrong. And so I think this speaks to that as well, that really as an industry, we need to take that step back and reevaluate our strategy and how we how we go about this. And so it makes sense. Uh, organizations are starting to think about vendor consolidation. I have started to run into some orgs that are starting to say that. Uh, and they're starting to think about it. And definitely, I think the call out about vendors being divided into por- portfolio versus platform is definitely true. If you look at recent acquisitions here, and I'm just going to use one as an example, uh, Broadcom acquired Symantec several years ago and their security business, and now recently acquired VMware and Carbon Black and their security business. And you know VMware has an endpoint management platform, Workspace ONE and Carbon Black. They may have a portfolio of security tools, but the Symantec stuff and that VMware Carbon Black stuff is sure as heck not going to work together today. You're not going to really see any synergies from it for many years to come. Versus something that's, you know, architected to work together from day one. So that's definitely a call. As you look at vendor consolidation strategy, you need to really get that sixth sense for what vendors have a true platform that has been built from the ground up to work together and which ones have a marketing department in overdrive telling you they do. And I would also agree that it's, it's not limited to any one area. I think in all parts of information security, we can look at getting an approach that makes it simpler and easier to manage. We talk about all the time, we're overwhelmed, people are burnt out, there's there's an ever-growing volume of alerts and threats and attacks. If we don't start taking real steps to simplify wherever possible, we're going to get overrun by all of that. And I think that's the other part of how is that working out for you? There isn't an infinite pool of money for more headcount, more tools, more headcount, more tools. So we have to work smarter, not harder, or just get bigger all of the time. So definitely, I think these key findings, they align with a lot of my thoughts and the thoughts we've shared on this show throughout, I think, its existence. So this kind of feels in some ways like validation that we've been on the right track. Um, not that I'm taking a victory lap or anything, because again, you know, there's plenty of work to do, but I, I agree with a lot of, uh, what's presented here. I do like your call out on support because I have personally worked with products that you have to try to integrate together. And what happens when you file a support ticket with one vendor, they're like, oh, you're trying to do this with this vendor. Well, it's obviously their fault, right? Like if, for example, you're trying to integrate Okta with um, Zscaler or Zscaler with Microsoft, you know, it's like, who should I file the ticket with? Because Mm -hmm. I have multiple vendors and sometimes you have to file them with both. And then I've actually been on calls where I've had both support folks from two different vendors talking to each other. And so that gets very complicated. And so I I do like that call out on support because it does make it a lot harder uh, when you have multiple vendors. So uh, there are some recommendations. I'll I'll go through some of these in the Gartner um, article here. Evaluate security platforms where they share data and control planes, leverage this consolidation to define common policies and reduce gaps and vulnerabilities between legacy silos. Evaluate your security needs for outbound communication. Determine where cloud-managed solutions fit your risk and business profiles. I do like that they call out cloud uh, versus, you know, like where they mentioned in the previous one, legacy or on-prem type solutions. Uh, Inventory data security controls to implement a multi-year phase-out of siloed data security tools that are holding you back. 
where when you need to leverage your data in favor of modern data security platforms, implement an in- integrated and converge security approach that covers the entire life cycle of cloud native applications, starting in development and extending into production. And then finally, evaluate workspace security packages united by extended detection and response as a meaningful way to reduce the complexity of security operations. I do like a lot of these recommendations. Any thoughts on those, Adam? Really, the one that jumps out at me is XDR. I I think this is something people might assume it's just another industry buzzword. And I, you would be forgiven in thinking that because over the past several years, you know, we've gone from everyone needs EDR. Everyone needs CASB. Everyone needs, uh, you know, take your picks, SWG, SEG. XDR is a meaningful differentiator for the security vendors who have one. When, you have a platform that is integrated out of the box to take alerts from disparate security tools and automatically correlate them into incidents. That is really powerful when you have that out of the box. So if you have a a platform where you can pivot from here's where the initial threat came in through email and here's how it landed on their endpoint and here's what that threat did on the endpoint. And then here's how they moved laterally within the organization on on on-premises Active Directory. Here's where they pivoted to the cloud and gained access to a third-party SaaS application. And we see all that behavior by integrating the CASB all together. Like that is a security operations dream, being able to follow the attacker so seamlessly through that as opposed to pivoting from different tool to different tool to different tool, trying to manually correlate, like what, what was the timestamp on that? What was the IP address on that? Trying to do that in their head. Or if you're really advanced and you've got that all built out in your SIM, hoping that your, your rules that are, that are pulling all that together aren't missing something and you don't have a gap in visibility. Um, just really, really powerful. So I think the call out there in XDR, I, I will say as a, you know, somebody who sells an XDR product, um, it's still amazing how little understanding customers have of the true game changing nature of that. And our employer is not the only XDR game in town. There's other good ones too. Palo Alto is very strong in that space in, in particular. Um, but security organizations aren't thinking about this enough. They still think they can buy, you know, a patchwork quilt of tools, throw all the alerts in their SIM, write a couple of rules, and they've got the same thing. And they don't. And so this this to me is um, something I would encourage our listeners not to sleep on. And again, that doesn't mean you need to buy my company's product. But in general, you should be moving towards a real holistic XDR strategy and evaluate what tools feed their XDR solution. And if that's going to give you visibility across the kill chain, because that's when it's really a difference maker. So the final topic that I wanted to talk about is really uh, the title of the podcast tonight, but it we've talked about this before and it came up again on a Twitter conversation uh, that I read through. And Adam, you said that you saw this too in our pre-show, mm-hmm. but I saw it through uh, Swift on security. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a pretty uh, popular person on Twitter for security and do we know Swift on security is male? I think so. Okay. I, I'm fairly certain. Cause I thought so too, but then I was like, wait a minute, should we, should we be using <laughs> they for their pronouns? I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure it's a, it's he's male, but I mean, I, I follow him and he replied uh, or quoted a tweet, which I'll read here. Got an email from my job saying all employees get a $30 gas card to alleviate high gas prices in parentheses. We are required to drive clients around when, why, when I went to sign up, it sent me another email saying I was fished by my tech department as a tester. And then I got assigned training. So this really about phishing campaigns or internal phishing campaigns 
And there were some replies to this that I was reading through and I was like, wow, um, we have some work as an industry on how to best convey what we're trying to do. So some of this, the replies here, I work for a healthcare company. They did a similar phishing test at the peak of COVID. Only it was an email saying I was fished. Oh, only it was an email saying the person by name has been nominated for HR for employee of the quarter for working hard through the pandemic made a bunch of people cry at work. And then finally, this one really got me. My mother-in-law's department sends next door links about injured pets and they get the pet pictures off employees' Facebooks to write the pet description. So I was a little bit floored by some of these phishing campaigns because I wanted to sit back and think about like, what are we trying to do as a security industry, as a security department? Like what is our goal when we have these phishing campaigns or attack simulations? I thought about my experience as a police officer. And if you don't know, police officers have a lot of leeway in what actions they can take. So if I contact you for speeding, you do not have to get a speeding ticket. That is totally up to the officer to give that ticket. And so some police officers subscribe to the punitive um, train of thought, which means you broke the law, so you deserve a ticket. Some newer police officers who are kind of more in line with the current way of law enforcement think about what is the behavior that's required today to prevent that from happening again. And so if say, for example, I pull over a mom and she's got three kids in the back and she's probably having a bad day, maybe miss the sign for speeding, I look at the record and it's completely clean, never had a speeding ticket before. Does that person deserve a speeding ticket? I mean, technically they broke the law, but most likely just the mere contact and pulling over and, you know, maybe giving a verbal warning will probably put that person on the right track again and not have that behavior repeat. You know, if they're going through that same area again, they'll remember, hey, uh, last time I got pulled over speeding, I'm going to slow down right here. And so that's the kind of thought process I am trying to apply towards these internal phishing campaigns where, you know, what is the behavior that we're trying to, you know, change or at least teach? And what is the best method to get there? Is that sending people, you know, nominations for HR in a healthcare company when they are working and tired to the bone um, some sort of, you know, award and then saying, oh, yeah, we got you, right? Is is that the best way or is, you know, there a better way to do it? Um, so that's kind of like, that's not really an answer, but those are my initial thoughts. On what, what do you have, Adam? I, I like exactly where you were going talking about your time as a law enforcement officer and, and some of that train of thought around what are what are our goals here? And I would say the same thing. Now, couple of notes. I saw this um, by a friend of the show, Christina Murillo had commented on it and she personally had, had found it really objectionable and, and her kind of take on it was we can do this in a more empathetic way, but also we need to recognize that we have layered security defense in depth that can help really protect against a lot of this risk too. And I think that's part of it. If we really take that, uh, that close look at this and ask like, what are our goals when single factor authentication was super common and we didn't have a lot of the advanced identity and access management platforms that can pull in the endpoint management status of the device and, and all these other factors, um, the, the common sign in characteristics for that user. When we just had single factor, if you show up and give me your username and password, and I don't care where you're from, you're getting in like the password we needed to protect a lot more, but hopefully organizations have evolved to the point where 
the places where I can do single factor and get access to just about anything are near zero. So another friend of the show, Daniel Stefaniak, who's former Microsoft FTE, used to, when he would talk to customers, write his password on the whiteboard at the beginning of any session with them and say, by the way, if you want to try to you know, break into my account, knock yourself out, here's my password. And that alone is not enough to get into a Microsoft employee's account because we don't ex- uh, accept single factor authentication anywhere. So if you're to that kind of security posture, which a lot of orgs are, then, then how much protection are you really getting from this? And if you keep in mind as well, that even the most well-run, most technical organizations with a well-crafted fish are still going to have a 5% or greater click rate or a 5% or greater response rate. Like you're, you're working towards a zero that won't come. And so as I advocate often on this show and other scenarios where 0% is unachievable, what we really need to think about is not how do we get to 0% because we can't, how do we deal with that and how do we mitigate that risk instead? And how do we accept that risk as we can't close that gap entirely? So what are other ways we can do to work around it? And so I think our phishing campaigns important to educate users. Sure. But I think we can do it in an empathetic way um, that doesn't have to be these gotchas. Now, we talked about this on the show before, and Andy and I kind of both had a different take at the time. And this is where, you know, security mindsets evolve with time, because I think we had a bit more of a hard line like, well, the bad guys are going to do this. So, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, if you get your feelings hurt from a phishing campaign, oh, well, um, the bad guys might hurt your feelings with a phishing campaign. But Anymore, I feel like, again, if you respond to a phishing attack and it's that easy for them to break into you, that's a feeling of of your security department at this point, not you. And I'm not saying like users shouldn't know better and we shouldn't continue to try to educate them of like, don't give your password away, please. But let's do the work to really make it so that if somebody gets a password, it's not the end of the world. That's where I kind of come out from today. And I think part of that is just, just the fact that it's I think 15 months since we last talked about this and in those 15 months, organizations have seen a real opportunity to modernize their identity and access management platforms and adopt some of those more advanced capabilities, those zero trust network architectures and all those sorts of things. So I think my feeling on this has evolved where, what are your goals? If you're, if your click rate is already under, you know, 10% of your response rates already under 5%, you've gotten about all you can get out of it. Are you just trying to get them? Are you, is this just like a gotcha thing? Because there is still there in some organizations where the security department, like is, is they're the, they think they're the smartest guys in the room and they're trying to get one over on everyone else and show how smart they are by crafting these really non-empathetic phishing campaigns. And I'm sure the response is very similar of like the bad guys are going to do it, but I don't know. I mean, like, I, I just feel like I've, I've come kind of come full circle on this. And I think a lot of orgs have been doing this so long because in security, there is a lot of group think where we do something because everyone else has been doing it. And so I think everyone does phishing campaigns because like, well, everybody does it. It's just what you do. But has anybody really sat and, and looked at like, what are the metrics we're trying to hit? What are reasonable goals from this effort? And if we have a goal to get to zero, then we have an impossible goal. So maybe we need to recalibrate them and we need to make a plan for mitigating that gap in risk where we are going to have responses. So how do we deal with that? So I, I'd say my, my feelings have evolved over time on this compared to where they once were. And that's a good thing. I think as security professionals, the industry always changes. Mm-hmm. And so you should be open to changing your thoughts on things Mm -hmm. and i do think that your call out on you know we have mitigations against phishing we have a secure email gateway we have mfa like you know we have an edr solution that if they download something and they execute it on the machine then you know we're protected and so the human behavior that we're trying to teach is really just another layer and it doesn't have to be 100% because 
None of your other solutions are 100%. There's going to be phishing emails that get through. There's going to be things that get executed on an endpoint that are not caught. I mean, that's why we have security and layers. And I think this is just one other layer. It's the human element. And it's never going to be 100%. And there are phishing campaigns right now that are phishing people for gas cards, right? It's a thing. And during COVID, there were phishing campaigns that targeted healthcare workers. So those are legitimate. But if I th- if your attitude as a security organization is to try to craft the most you know, sophisticated email that you think is going to trick your users, I think that's the wrong attitude to have. I think it's more like, hey, you know, what is the thing we're trying to teach them and how can we make them better so that we are more protected as an organization rather than, you know, the punitive cop who's just giving you a ticket because, you know, you sped. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like some of these organizations that are going to the point where they're like looking at people's Facebook and getting pictures off of that. Like I think having a phishing campaign is fine and having a product to do that just use the canned stuff that's in there because I think that in itself is good enough to teach that behavior. Like look for this. If you see this, here's the report message button or here's the phishing button that you click to report it. Right. And so that is the behavior we're trying to teach. And so really just a canned, you know, whatever, Oh, through 65 credential harvesting, you know, email template, send that out and you should be good. And it should look fishy enough right that users are gonna look at it and be like oh in fact um i got an email this week from a vendor that i was looking at the email and i thought man this has to be a phishing email although it kind of looks legitimate too and it was from microsoft through a vendor for me to get like a nice little reward for doing something and i thought man this is cruel if if it is, but you know, I'm a security professional. I looked at it. I'm like, this looks shady. <laughs> and so I, I sent a screenshot to Adam and a bunch of peers of mine. I said, Hey, is this legit? Like this looks like phishing. Mm-hmm. And you know, Adam came back and said, yeah, Microsoft's used that vendor to do things um, for many years. So um, I clicked on it after that and, and received my little gift. But um, that's the type of behavior I think you want to train your users to, you know, check with someone, check with security um, to make sure if it's legitimate. I do also want to mention that, you know, Defender for Office has a pretty unique feature, which is licensed, you know, of course, with um, Defender for Office Plan 2 or M365 E5. and has this thing called payload automations or payload harvesting, which actually takes real world phishing attack messages that were reported by your users and then crafts them to look like phishing attacks from your attack simulator within Defender for Office. So I thought that was pretty neat because you're taking actual attacks against your organization and then sending them out. So it's not like you're sending out anything that's malicious or that you're trying to get them. You're just giving them examples of things that are already coming in that they should be looking for, but in more of a safe manner, because if they do click on it, you're like, Hey, this is training. This is something we've seen that has actually come into the organization and you know, it's all automated. So I thought that was a pretty neat feature. Just want to mention that of, uh, of course, like if you're using a different uh, fishing simulator, that's perfectly fine to just, again, use the canned fishing. Like I said, mm-hmm. so those are my thoughts on that. Any other thoughts, Adam? Yeah, I, I think just one last thought you, you kind of brought up there at the very end is the 90-10 rule. You hear applied to a lot of different things. I, I think it applies here to, to like user training as well, where you're going to get you know 90% effectiveness like in the first 10% of doing it. And, and after that, like the final 10% is really hard to make incremental improvement on. So yes, do, do some phishing campaigns, you know, use that payload harvesting Andy just talked about, get something out there, educate users who make the wrong choice and, and be empathetic and hopefully they'll make the right one next time. But just understand again, like with very little effort, you can get 90% of the results. 
you know, you're going to get 90% of the reduction in click rate that you desire pretty quickly. And from there, it's very diminishing returns. I think based on kind of user behavior and just what I observe in the world. And, and Andy, I, I just kind of loved you sharing that, that, you know, as security professionals, we, we will look at messages too, and, and certainly we'll have a skeptical eye for them, but sometimes it's just like, gosh, I just can't tell. And that's a great idea is just ask a friend or ask somebody else where they can speak to and say, yes, that is a vendor we work with regularly. It's the right time of year for it because this is when they're sending out like rewards and that sort of thing. So yes, that is legit. And that's, that's just a great way to think about it. So perfect example. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.